Hello, welcome to the conversation here on New Central Television. This is the show where we bring you the latest political updates and all the stories happening around the continent of Africa. I'm Benga Aboroa. And I am Rita Omodia. It's so good to have you join us again in another week in the month of February for another exciting edition of The Conversation on New Central TV. Now, on today's edition of The Conversation, we will be discussing the situation in Uganda where members of parliament have protested against continued violation of human rights. And we will also turn our attention to Tunisia, where Supreme Judicial Council has refused the solution by President Kais Said. So let's start the conversation in Uganda. As members of the opposition in the Ugandan parliament have protested the continued violation of rights of Ugandans by staging a walkout from the plenary sessions. The MPs led by the leader of the opposition, Oder Bumataya Tumpuga, asked the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Anita Among, to suspend the House until the government provides answers on the continued detention without trial of Ugandans' torture and disappearances. Honorable Umpuga said that they have, on several occasions, raised the matter of incarceration of their colleagues. Honorable Mohamed Segrinya, the Kawaf Mikpe North MP, and Honorable Alan Sewanyana, the Makindye West MP, without trial in vain. The tortured victims have been witnessed. And while that is going on, the state actors are unable to explain uh, the killings that are illegal and extrajudicial, the disappearance and torture of citizens, those have, who we have seen, known, and those unseen. This is taking place in all parts of the country, says Honorable Mpuga. He said that they will boycott Parliament for two weeks until the government answers their concerns and demands uh, that the Speaker suspends the House. Now, join us on the conversation today to discuss uh, this and the human rights situation in Uganda is, we have Hillary Innocent Taylor Seguya, a human rights activist, joins us live from Boston in the United States of America. Thanks for joining us, Hillary. Well, thank you so nice much. Nice to I'm have you, Hillary. Up. Thank you so much. Now, Hillary, members of the opposition in Parliament have protested the continued violation of rights of Ugandans by staging a walkout from the plenary sessions, continued and they continue to demand that plenary sitting be suspended until the government provides accountability for the disappearance of citizens and detention without trial. How effective can these protests be in addressing the human rights situation in Uganda? Of course, there is a clear human rights uh, crisis in Uganda. And again, it has been uh, you know, a series of events whereby we're seeing that the, the regime mm -hmm is violating our rights on an instant day-to-day uh, -day policy. So it's like a policy for the regime to violate our rights, mainly for the dissidents. So for the parliament to come out and protest uh, for two weeks, uh, resisting, of course, uh, the extrajudicial killings and uh, the arbitrary arrests and detentions without trial, of even MPs, uh, it speaks volumes because uh, today parliament, uh, which is in charge of uh, legislation, has failed also to uh, uh, you know, rescue uh, their Two colleagues. So two members of parliament, Alan Sewanyan and uh, Honorable Mohammed Seglinya, have been also incarcerated uh, since last year in, in September. And we've been on campaigns, uh, you know, making different processes uh, back home and also here in the diaspora, are demanding the government of Uganda to release these MPs, but nothing has been done. And so we've been telling the parliament that if that can be done to legislators or lawmakers, how about we ordinary Ugandans? Because you cannot go and sit in parliament every day uh, debating about different things, while you cannot debate about uh, your fellow MPs who are being uh, you know, illegally arrested by this uh, regime of despot Museveni. So what we see, of course, is uh, the, the regime of Museveni is using fear uh, in order to you know, uh, strengthen their grip to power. So for the last 36 years, we've had one gentleman, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, as the yeah. president of Uganda. So there is basically absolute power in his uh, regime. He's the one to decide uh, who to arrest and all, who not to arrest. And today we've also seen that uh, the rule of law in Uganda has become uh, selective. Mm. If you are a dissident, then uh, they're going to use uh, jail. They're going to use uh, fear or torture as the only weapon to silence you. We all know that uh, the two MPs who were abducted, uh, who were in, in, imprisoned, uh, Segilinya and Sewanyana, 
yeah. they need to commit any crime. Mm. These are politically motivated charges. So they slapped murder charges on them, but they have never killed anyone. When they go to court and you know they, 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 their, uh, their lawyers ask for evidence, they don't produce anything. So in other words, the prosecutor is just wasting court time and also uh, retaining these uh, MPs in parliament just well, for, for no crime. Well, Hillary, then, how, how effective will this protest be? How effective is it going to be? You talked so much about how Museveni has violated human rights in Uganda. With this protest going on, do you think it's going to change the mind of the president? Well, uh, we, we think that it will yield some, some, some results at the end of the day because we believe that since parliament has stepped out, now it's showing uh, you know, the, 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 the executive that uh, the parliament is no longer taking things as business as usual. So they've stepped up and now they're saying for two weeks, uh, we shall be walking out of the plenary. We shall not be sitting uh, debating about different things, changing the debate. So right now they want uh, the priority of parliament uh, to debate about uh, the human rights violations in our country, Uganda. And we believe that in two weeks, of course, uh, as the Speaker of Parliament said, that uh, they will be hearing from uh, those who the actors who are concerned uh, to make sure that uh, you know, the state uh, responds to the concerns of uh, these legislators, uh, mainly the leader of opposition. So uh, we're just uh, positive, but uh, anything can happen because we are dealing with a dictator. And dictators, of course, you know, uh, they can violate your rights at any time. So you cannot say, I cannot you know, uh, predict the outcomes, but okay. I will remain positive for now. Okay, Ilari, just to buttress your point, because we also got reports from the Amnesty International that the country in Uganda, uh, security forces unlawfully killed at least 66 people in the period from March 2020 when COVID-19 lockdown measures were introduced in Uganda. But now there have been allegations that the Uganda Patriotic Defenses Forces, that's the UPDF, act like a military wing of the ruling party that is the national resistance movement. What are your thoughts on this? And well, what's the human that, rights uh, situation on the ground in Uganda as we speak? Yes, uh, right now we see, because for me, I don't believe that we have a government. I call it a junta because uh, we clearly know that uh, Chagulani Robert Sentamu, who is on the opposition, won the elections, but his victory was denied. And of course, uh, Museveni had to be sworn in as uh, the, the, the 10th president of, of Uganda, but of course we know uh, the person who won the elections. So today, uh, Yori Toguta Museveni is using the military as his tool in order to uh, retain himself in, uh, into power for you know, maybe to become a lifetime president. Hmm. So uh, and the, the, the army also is led by his uh, close family members. So if you look at uh, SFC, the Special Forces Command, uh, which is torturing people nowadays, uh, it is led by his son, Mohose, uh, General Mohose Kainero Gaba, who he has rapidly uh, promoted in the army to make sure that, of course, uh, he controls uh, the army and also probably uh, becomes his uh, successor. And uh, the, of course, uh, with the killings we're talking about that happened uh, in 2020 of November, uh, that was a time when Ugandans, of course, were uh, resisting. Uh, the, the illegal arrest of Chagulani Robert Sentamu uh, by then, and uh, over 57 Ugandans were killed. Mm. And from that time, we've never received any report uh, from security forces. We've never received any investigation. And nobody has given an accountability of, uh, on the number of deaths of Ugandans that you know, we lost during that time. So as other different uh, human rights organizations noticed, like Amnesty International, mm. also recently we had uh, the Universal Periodical Review, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, they reviewed our country and they were all talking about uh, these, you know, uh, continued, uh, uh, you know, massacres of innocent Ugandans uh, uh, from, from security forces. So today, the army, which is supposed to, you know, defend our country and fight the enemy, has become an army that is fighting Ugandans. A partisan so the army is looking at us as enemies, yet we are civilians, we don't have anything. So the army also is doing the, the role of the police because right now what uh, this regime has done is to militarize all institutions. So from the army to the police, every institution is taken up by, uh, by the military uh, because uh, the plan is to make sure that they, they put you know, fear into people they want to silence us, but most of us are saying that uh, the time is now never to be, uh, you know, muzzled by these 
uh, you know, oppressors because we want to give uh, our country a chance to, you know, for liberty, justice, and freedom to reign. That's why we are speaking up and we're raising up our voices. We're saying that enough is enough. It is time uh, to make sure that liberty reigns in our country, Uganda, and call out all the perpetrators, all uh, the tormentors, uh, to be held accountable because we don't believe in torture. Torture should be uh, criminalized. Now, Hillary, talking about enough is enough. Yesterday, uh, in Ugandan Twitter sphere, the hashtags uh, justice for Kakwenza and uh, Uganda is bleeding uh, were trending uh, following uh, revelations of Ugandan uh, novelist Kakwenza Rukira Bashaija, who was tortured by the Ugandan government in prison over his novel, The Greedy Barbarian. I did see that uh, you posted a video of his uh, excerpts of that exclusive he gave to NTV uh, Uganda. What were your thoughts after listening to his harrowing experience in the hands of uh, Ugandan security forces? And why is it important for the world to hear about his story? Yes, uh, the story of uh, Kakwenza was very heartbreaking. And uh, these are the things that we've been talking about time and again. So we've been exposing this uh, regime of Despot M70 uh, on different social media platforms. Because today, as uh, mainly the young people, we've embraced uh, the tool of social media to make sure that uh, we expose all the injustices of this regime uh, to the world to know uh, what evil you know, acts they are doing. So uh, Kakwenza was, you know, um, abducted from his house in wee hours by the security forces uh, two weeks, like literally like three weeks ago. And uh, he was, of course, taken to, uh, you know, unknown uh, secret uh, torture chambers. And he was badly beaten, nearly to death. Because if you look at his uh, entire body, mainly the back, mm -hmm. it is full of wounds. They were using all different types of tools that can be, you know, thought about to torture someone. So they wiped him, they were using uh, uh, pliers, pulling out his nails, they were using uh, barbed wires, they were using electric shocks, and also some waterboarding to make sure that uh, they stop him from speaking up. And his only crime he did as Kakwenza, an author, was to speak his free mind. So uh, today we have, we've uh, clearly seen that uh, fear of speech in Uganda is replacing freedom of speech. And uh, the junta we have in power, it is clearly assaulting freedom of speech. But we're reminding, uh, of course, the regime of Despot M70 that freedom of speech is a fundamental human right that all Ugandans have to enjoy. So as leaders in power, we expect them to be tolerant, to diverse of opinion. But because Kakwenza criticized uh, the first son of uh, President M70, uh, he felt so offended. That's why he had to uh, come for him at his house and they tortured him badly. So uh, hearing the audio, that uh, Kakwenza you know, went through uh, in that torture chamber that was on orders of uh, M7's son, was Kainero Gaba. Of course, it made us, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some of us, uh, you know, shed tears because whatever happened was so inhumane. Uh, it was degrading and it is against, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the constitution of Uganda. Sorry, Hillary, just to get things uh, straight, because I mean, you just made, a very serious allegation there. How do you know that the orders to torture uh, Kakwenza came from General uh, Mahuzi? General Mahuzi. Kainere well, if, if, you, if, if you listen to uh, some of uh, the, the, the video interviews that Kakwenza has been doing, he has uh, also said that uh, at two, ti at two times, mm. uh, he was able to meet uh, the son of uh, Museveni. So it is very evident that uh, because the tweets were about him and he also met him uh, to ask him why he was criticizing him. And they even made sure that they had to, after beating him and making him, you know, dance uh, throughout the night after being tortured, uh, they made sure that they record him uh, apologizing uh, to Iwari Kagutam Seveni and his son, Mohoz um, Kainaru Gaba. And this speaks volumes because Kakwenza in his video is saying that he's using uh, the, the word we. It means that it was a group of uh, Ugandans who are being tortured. 
in mm -hmm. such centers. Yeah. And it is sad that we don't know the rest. Who, who are the rest? Because if he's saying we were beaten, we were made to dance all the night or, all, or the entire night, yeah. then the, the question remains, uh, who are the rest? Uh, will we get a chance even to hear their audio or not? Because very many Ugandans have been disappeared. Very many of them have been tortured, but a few of them are able to come out and tell their uh, experience. Uh, within uh, from those that are chambers. So we believe that uh, whatever they are doing is to make sure that they send a message to the public that uh, whoever is descending, uh, is dissenting our misrule, uh, we are going to do the same that we did to uh, Kakwenza or Kira Basaija. But we are not going to cow. We're not going to give up on our country. Okay. We have to rise up and you know resist uh, this kind of yeah. injustices. So I think we're going to stand in solidarity with our, our brother, uh, Kakwenza, to make yeah. sure that he gets the justice because we want all the tormentors uh, to be tried before the law because uh, torture is uh, you know, a crime in the constitution of Uganda. It also violates uh, the international treaties that we signed. Uh, yeah. For example, if you look at that, the convention against torture and also uh, the international covenant on civil and political rights, all yeah. these things, uh, have been all these international laws have been violated by this regime of uh, Yorick Wutam Seveni. You know, so we he, need accountability. Hillary, as you paint this picture, it's very gory in my mind, and it's so sad in that sort of situation is happening in recent times. But as you rightly said, you mentioned so many laws that are going on to prohibit torture, and of course, we also know of the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act in 2012. So what exactly is the problem? Because we have these laws uh, to prohibit torture in Uganda, but somehow we still see torture going on in Uganda. So is it part of the failure of the government or is it lack of real power to, to implement this laws going on in Uganda? Well, of course, uh, today we are living in a state of lawlessness and uh, the constitution of Uganda has lost me meaning because uh, it has been you know, ripped uh, not only by those who are in power, but also by the judiciary. So very many times uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, Yowari Kawutam Seveni, uh, who is heading this junta, uh, trying to make you know ridiculous amendments in the constitution. At first, he came and removed the age limit because he wanted to become a lifetime president. Then he, he came also and removed the term limits. So now uh, the constitution has lost meaning. And what only Ugandans have to do right now is to remove him and you know uh, make amendments in this constitution that are pro-people, not anti-people. So even the judiciary is living in fear because today judges, you can clearly see that they are working on orders from those who are uh, from above. The judges cannot, you know, stand uh, to defend the constitution. They are also, uh, you know, uh, working hand in hand with the junta to shred this constitution. So if we lose the constitution like that, then it means that uh, all the laws uh, will be violated. And also, if you look at uh, what's happening to MPs. The lawmakers of our country yeah. that are being also uh, brutally beaten. They are being also uh, arbitrarily arrested and detained without trial. So it tells you that uh, there is no rule of law in Uganda. So as uh, young tax who believe in rule of law, as Ugandans who are concerned about the status quo, we are saying that uh, this cannot go on. Mm. Now we want change. That's why we are rising up and we're saying enough is enough. We want a better Uganda with justice, a better Uganda with rule of law, a better Uganda with accountability, a better Uganda that is going to make sure that all of us are respected and we are treated equally and also uh, in a dignified way. So um, we believe that uh, we have to just resist this junta and you know, free ourselves from this military captivity of 36 years. Now, talking about solutions to ending uh, human rights abuses in Uganda, the 1995 Constitution of Uganda established the Ugandan Human Rights Commission. It was established to promote and protect human rights and freedoms in the country in recognition of Uganda's violent and turbulent uh, history. You remember uh, Uganda under Amin and Milton Obote that, that was characterized uh, by arbitrary arrest, detention, and trial without uh, detention without trial, torture, brutal yeah. repression, and impunity on the part of security organs. I'm sure when you hear me reeling all this out, it, it, it seems like a throwback to the Amin years. How has the Ugandan Human Rights Commission fed in its mandate? And uh, are we back to the times of uh, General Idi Amin? Yes. Uh, 
Thank you for that good question. Uh, the, human, the Uganda Human Rights Commission has totally failed us. It has not been on the side of the oppressed, but it is working uh, for the oppressors. So uh, this was an institution that was put in place to make sure that it fights for our rights uh, by uh, those who violate them. But uh, recently, uh, with the, you know, the kidnap of uh, Kakwenza, uh, the head of the Uganda Human Rights Commission was also blaming uh, the dissidents that uh, they are portraying a bad image about security forces and they are torturing people before the world. But photos came out uh, for Kakwenza and she couldn't say anything. So it clearly shows you that uh, these are people who are also muzzled because they fear for their lives. Because today, uh, as you talked about the past regimes of Idi Amin Dada, uh, as, for, as for us young people, we are studying about these things in history books. But now we are seeing the re reality about the past regimes of our country, Uganda. Mm -hmm. And our question is very clear because the, the preamble of our question talks about uh, recalling the history of our country that was characterized by uh, political instability and constitutional instability. So it was because of uh, the, the flagrant violation of human rights that happened in past regimes. Even the regimes in seven was criticizing that we are seeing the same things today. And in fact, today we are seeing worst things compared to the regimes of uh, Idi Amin Dada and uh, Milton Obote. Amin, of course, uh, was demonized mainly by the West that he didn't you know, uh, respect human rights and so on and so forth. And Amin had some achievements. I would not say that he was a good, it was, it was a good leader because I, and I cannot stand and you know, human rights any, uh, fascist. But Amin did not reach the extent of Yoweri Kaguta Museveni. So because the West is using Museveni today as their puppet, because we've started also extracting oil, they are silent when it comes to violation of our rights. And the settlements we're seeing from the national organizations today, like uh, maybe like uh, our development partners, like at uh, the US embassy, the European Union, mm -hmm. they're just using words. But Ugandans are saying enough is enough. Can we move beyond words? Because if you look at their settlements, the only words, they're using the same words year after year. We recommend, we urge, we, we, we call upon. Yeah. The statements. So nothing has been, yeah, has been done in terms of action. And with sanctions that they are putting on some of the commenters, yeah. we've seen that they've not worked. So I think uh, as development partners, as the international community, uh, they have to put more pressure on this regime and remind it uh, the international laws that uh, we ratified, that we're also signatory to, uh, to make sure that they start respecting, promoting, and protecting human rights of all Ugandans, not a few that are supporting this uh, regime of Kagutam 7. You know, Hillary, it's more looking more like the more you look, the less you see, you talk, and then the next thing you disappear in Uganda. And uh, the, the statement from the president is not necessarily uh, coincided with what we're seeing or what we're hearing from you going on in Uganda, because we saw a video where President Yoweri Museveni was asking security agencies not to torture people. We also know that on 4th of February 2022, he launched the new uh, law year of 2022, and he spoke uh, uh, so strongly against torture, uh, uh, against torture of, uh, of uh, personnel. He also talked about the parliament's legislating policies in favor of the people, and he also uh, reiterated uh, the fact that there should be no delays in the rendering justice. So what strategy do you think Museveni is deploying? Well, uh, today, of course, every Ugandan, uh, mainly, okay, I would say majority of Ugandans today will, uh, will, will agree with me that um, Seveni has a history of deception. Mm. It's not the first time that he's telling such lies. So he has a list of uh, huge fat lies that he's telling uh, before the world because now what he wants to show that uh, he, he's very good at timing. So once he knows that uh, the universal periodical review is about to come, then he'll make good settlements. That as Uganda, uh, we condemn torture. As Uganda, uh, it is wrong for security forces uh, to, to you know, uh, torture Ugandans or beat Ugandans or kill Ugandans. Yeah. But he has not taken any further step apart from the, the rhetoric he's using. And we're not seeing also uh, seriousness for, in terms of following up. Because if you call yourself the commander in chief, and you know, uh, it is your army that is killing mm. Ugandans. So as the commander in chief, we expect you to do actions. Uh, put orders that I want to know who killed these Ugandans, but there is nothing like that. So it means 
it is either uh, true that uh, he has no idea about what's happening in our country, Uganda, that he lost control, the mafias who are controlling our country or are controlling him, or he's just doing it deliberately to make sure that, of course, uh, he instills more fear in Uganda. So we are worried as Ugandans, but uh, we have to fight back and say this cannot go on because the history of lying, we call him a pathological liar. Truth is not his friend. So in other words, uh, it is uh, like telling lies is like his official language. He will always come and you know give empty promises. And at the end of the day, he doesn't follow up. So as the commander in chief, can Museveni tell us who has been killing Ugandans? Because you are heading the army. How can you tell us that you cannot control your army? And, and you know, mm. you come out and tomorrow you tell us that uh, uh, you're the head of the state. That alone should be a one reason for him to step aside and resign and okay. say that I'll fail to take this country forward. Let me give another person an opportunity to make sure that Uganda goes forward. But he's silent. So he knows exactly what his son is doing. Just to take you back in 2018, uh, Bobby Wine was almost killed in Arua. So uh, they killed yes. his driver, Yasin Kauma. So they had gone for a, a campaign trail and they met in one region called Arua, Arua district. So uh, because Museveni wanted to be the only person to campaign, then he had to make sure that he sends uh, his security forces. That is SFC still, the special command, uh, the special command forces that, that is headed by his son, Mohoz Kainero Gaba. And they assassinated quite, quite a, Yasin Kauma. And, and, and Bobby Wine has continued to talk against the government. I mean, see the release of his music, that's the Ogenda song, where he talked so much about uh, the administration of uh, President Iwere Museveni. Uh, come again, I didn't hear that. I said I was reiterating what you were saying, and uh, you talked about Bobby Wine, and I said, uh, despite mm. continuous attention of Bobby Wine being an opposition, we still see Bobby Wine talking against the administration of Museveni, even with his song, Ogenda. Oh, yeah, yes, that's true. Uh, of course, Bobby Wine has been resilient and he has been uh, also persistent in this, uh, mm. you know, revolution. Because uh, right, right now, of course, we see very many young people who are not concerned about uh, the politics of Uganda being inspired by, uh, the, 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 by people like Bobby Wine to come and, you know, join forces to make sure that we liberate ourselves from this captivity. Because in the past uh, years, you would see that millennials, and Generation Z were less uh, concerned about the status quo, and also elites. But today, elites also, it is good that uh, they are putting aside their academic credentials, and they are coming forward to make sure that uh, we free ourselves uh, from this military junta. Because it is, I call it like, I would say it is like um, a rogue uh, state, because there is no you know, democracy, there is no uh, respect for human rights, there is no accountability, everything is in a mess. And we cannot afford to look on as our country, Uganda, is collapsing for our eyes. So yeah, I finally, think, uh, as uh, Ugandans... okay, just, just before we wrap things up, because we're fast running out of time, in what ways uh, do you think civil society, the international organization and religious uh, institutions in Uganda uh, can bring the government uh, to account for uh, human rights and uh, ending torture in Uganda in 30 seconds, please. Yes, uh, right now what we what we see, of course, uh, the case of uh, Kakwenza and also uh, the case of um, the, 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 the NUP guy who was uh, tortured, uh, Masereka has to unite us because if we are not united by uh, these cases of torture, then it means as, as Ugandans, uh, mainly the dissidents, uh, we cannot move out from this, uh, you know, uh, uh, captivity of the Oracle of Utam 70. So as political leaders, as cultural leaders, as civil society organizations, as uh, international development, you know, uh, uh, partners, we have to come out and stand in solidarity with Ugandans who are oppressed, repressed and suppressed uh, to make sure that, of course, uh, we get them liberty. Because if you fail to do okay. so, then it means that we are prolonging uh, this extrajudicial killing and the torture of uh, this, you know, brutal regime of the warrior of Utam Seven. And just to precisely, I would say that uh, we've been, we've seen many Ugandans being muzzled. Mainly the media, the media is now uh, biased, and mm. some, some of it 
uh, is working with the state, some of it is working in fear. They are censored. They cannot talk about these atrocities. So we call upon the media and cultural leaders plus religious leaders. They have been so quiet in this uh, extreme you know, torture of Ugandans. Mm. So if they come out and we join our forces, I believe uh, we shall defeat this junta that is oppressing, repressing, and suppressing Ugandans for the last 36 years. Thank you very much, Hilary Seguya, for joining us uh, from Boston, United States of America, to uh, address and talk mm -hmm. about the human rights situation uh, in Uganda. We do appreciate your insights, and we wish you Thank all you so the best. much. Thank you for hosting me. Okay, you're watching the conversation on New Central Television. We'll go on a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be at Touch and Base with Tunisia. Join us again. Many thanks for staying with us. If you just join us, we have been discussing the situation in Uganda where we understand that members of the opposition in parliament protested the continued violation of rights of Ugandans by staging a walkout from the plenary sessions. And now we turn our attention to Tunisia. The country's Supreme Judicial Council refuses the dissolution by President Kai Said. The president over the weekend dissolved a judicial council that deals with the independence of judges, Said, who in July 2021 sacked the government, suspended parliament, and seized a string of powers in the only democracy to have emerged from the Arab Springs a decade ago. It said on Sunday that the Supreme Judicial Council was a thing of the past. He also accused council members of taking billions in bribes and delaying politically sensitive investigations, including into the assassinations of left-wing activists in 2013. The decision raises fears about the independence of the judiciary and caps months of his sharp criticism of Tunisia's judges. John also discussed this as Dr. Osama Kibir, a weapons system engineer and researcher in, the, in computer science at the Institut Superior de Gestion in Tunis. Thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Kibir. Hello, everyone. Now, I, I have the honor to be invited to participate in such uh, interesting subject for the Central TV. I will start by a brief description of the relation of uh, the President Kai Said and uh, the Muslims Brotherhood uh, to uh, describe uh, the political situation. Uh, then I will discuss uh, the problem that have been yesterday. Uh, after President Kai Said assumed his duty, the movement tried to restrict his power and promote throughout its media wings that he is a vocal phenomenon far from meeting the aspirations of his volunteer. The Free Constitutional Party, which included leaders from the Ben Ali regimes, was also able to play the roles of the traditional opponent of the Islamist. Uh, disturbed the work of the parliament, parliament led by the Nada movement and trying to withdraw confidence from the Speaker of the Council, which despite his filial lost than which is his political and moral symbolism within his movement. Do, during the expected po uh, popular protests demanding the overthrow of the government on July 25, 2021, due to the historical significance and uh, dimension of this day, President Kai Said announced a number of users uh, pursuant to the Article 80 of the Constitution in the absence of the Supreme Constitutional Court to rules on the validity on its interpretation, most notably suspension of the works of the Parliament. With the popular uh, uploads for this measure, Kai Said win his battle of taking the power, while another realized that any violent reaction to the decision would be the last nail in its coffin. Now, Osama, As, it, Osama can what? you hear me? Isama, can you hear me? 
You've been narrating. You. Yes, you've been narrating the ordeals of uh, the uh, president, as Kai Said now uh, um, shutting down the Supreme Judicial Council, and we've seen reactions from it. Now, the head of the Supreme Judicial Council, Yusuf Buzakir, said Said's declaration represented an attempt to bring judges on the presidential instruction. Now, from the report we've seen now, we've all seen police officers uh, barricading the offices of the Judicial Council. If this is so, what effect will this dissolution have on the populace and the institution of democracy in Tunisia? Mm -hmm. President Kaisai didn't, did not mean to suspend the work of the Supreme Judicial Council. I consider that the Council to be the product of democracy in Tunisia. Uh, the Supreme Juridical Council actually started work in 2016, and it uh, includes committees of judges and lawyers elected from their uh, counterpart. But the work of this council did not rise to fighting corruption in uh, the judiciary. That is why he called President to restrict this council. We have two points of view. The first one think that the restriction of the Supreme Judicial Council will be uh, in accordance with, with a presidential order, and this will not negatively affect democracy in Tunisia, since the country is currently living a state of exception in accordance with Article 18 of the Tunisian Constitution, on which the President of the Republic elected when, uh, when he uh, announced the suspension of the work of the Assembly of the Representative of the People on July 25. For the second point of view, view Kais Said's decision raised fear about the independence of uh, judiciary and was uh, sure to anger his opponent. The Judicial Council head Yusuf Bouzakri said the move was illegal. The political authorities of the state is divided into uh, legislative, executive, and juridical powers to most effectively promote liberty. Those three powers must must be separated and acting independently. The distinction of the Supreme Judicial Council is just the last move by Said to tighten his grips on power. Uh, I have uh, another now, idea now, about uh, now, Osama. Uh, my question to you is this. With all that is going on, the usurpation of powers by President Kai Said and the recent dissolution of the Judicial Council, do you think that uh, President Kai Said has eroded all the gains of the Arab Spring 10 years ago? Is Tunisia moving towards a dictatorship? Uh, I think that Kai Said is doing well by taking the power he, he will restrict and he will uh, creating uh, a new system in Tunisia. Uh, for this moment, uh, I think that uh, Kais Said is, uh, he, he will have all the power in his hand and maybe uh, it's present, uh, create fear about democracy in Tunisia. What would you say about the economy in Tunisia, um, Usama? Do you feel the president has been able to uh, build up the economy in Tunisia? Uh, for me, the voices that opposed the decision of President Said, including one member of the Supreme Judicial Council, actually want to play the role of the victims and consider that uh, what the president of the, the Republic has done Regreeding the destruction of the Council is a defamation of the Tunisian uh, judiciary. Actually, the President Kais Said will not stand down regreeding what he declared. First, the decree issued by the President of the Republic Kais Said related to the revision of Basic Law Number 34 of 2016 relating the Supreme Judicial Council stipulate and and to the grant and privileges guaranteed to the member of the Supreme Judicial Council. According, he considered that his decision did not affect the Council, its system, and its power. It it's stopped grant and privilege to member. I yeah. think that he can share the Supreme Judicial Council as is the case in France, and the independence of uh, judges cannot be linked to the composition of the Council. Secondly, 
I think that Qais Saeed will not back down because he has previously uh, severely uh, criticized the amount of the grant and the huge co uh, quantities of gasoline used by the judges with some evidence. Usama, Usama, can you hear me? Now, this council's dissolution was uh, comes on the ninth anniversary of the killing. I'm sure you're familiar with him, the assassination of secular politician that is Shokri Belayed. What can you say about this man, Shokri Belayed, that was killed? And till now, people are protesting. We saw protests yesterday uh, talking about persecution of these killers. Uh, I can't hear you uh, clearly. Okay, can you can you talk more about the assassination of Shokri Belayed, uh, the leftist who was killed, who was also a man who uh, talked about human rights? For uh, the assassination of uh, Shokri Belayed in 2013, I think that uh, uh, Saeed should open this uh, uh, this uh, subject and discuss more and find a solution for uh, this. Uh, problem in Tunisia, uh, protestation uh, uh, for uh, knowing the reality of uh, this, uh, this assassination of uh, Shokri Belaid and finding uh, uh, who is guilty and who have the uh, main, main, uh, main authorities and to, uh, to have uh, power uh, throughout this assassination. I think uh, that uh, uh, in, uh, two, in 2019, when the president, uh, Beji Qaid Sipsi, uh, was in the power, uh, he uh, didn't show all the evidence to uh, the media because he have uh, a lot of, uh, uh, he have a lot of uh, uh, political uh, point of views with Nava to, uh, uh, and he used this uh, uh, this subject uh, to to make pressure on Nava to have more power and uh, to to take uh, uh, to take to to okay. stand up in his place and uh, to know what he is doing. Okay, um, Osama, uh, President Kai Said in December last year announced that Parliament uh, was suspended since July would remain so until. He set elections for December of this year. With the current events unfolding, what are the chances that these elections will even hold in December? And uh, would it even be a fair one? I think uh, that uh, Qais Saeed uh, really, uh, he, uh, the salvation is based on corruption case against uh, some judges. Uh, judges uh, who did not act on the Tunisian judiciary. He also did not wait for the election of the Supreme Council of uh, the Judiciary, which were programmed in October 22. Um, I uh, could not... Uh, hi, could you hear me? Yes, yes we can sir. hear you. Do you feel elections will hold this December? Osama? Parliamentary elections. Okay, I think uh, we've lost Osama's audio, and uh, this is a fine place uh, to uh, draw the curtains on today's uh, conversation. Uh, we've been talking about the MPs boycotting yes, uh, parliamentary Uganda. sessions plenary in Uganda because of the uh, dire human rights situations there. And back in Tunisia, we know of uh, the president suspending parliament, uh, sacked parliament. We also know right now of uh, the dissolvement of uh, the Supreme Judicial Council, which is a body uh, in charge of the independence of the judiciary, and it leaves a question on what happens to the judiciary when we exactly. do not have the body that is supposed to make this uh, uh, judicial laws. laws independent. And of course, it restricts uh, human rights. Uh, it also uh, affects the democracy institution in Tunisia. Uh, and I think Tunisia's case is very, we've been talking about coups in the West African uh, um, region of Africa, and uh, no one is really paying attention to what's going it's on. It's like it's a strategy in, in, that Kaisa yes, is using. Yes, it's almost like a constitutional coup. He's been uh, aggregating powers to himself since July last year. Now yeah. it's the turn of the judiciary. So 
I wonder when everyone will wake up and say, you know what? Uh, I this think is he's no playing longer a funny a one there. Exactly. This is uh, military, a, a slight, I mean, it's a, a civilian it's a coup, so to a say. civilian coup, exactly. And you know, members of his uh, party or his parliament have even uh, gone against him. We saw one of them in January also mm -hmm. that said she does not align with the ideologies of Kai Sai. So even within his uh, close allies, we see people not aligning yes. with him. And the longer he stays and uh, takes all authorities, the more uh, brave he will, the braver he is in taking more constitutional powers and uh, leaving the constitution. I mean, how suspended. do we have a country where there is no constitution? You talked about, he talked about constitutional reform, uh, yes. but right now we've not seen anything on board for There's this reform. There's a consultation period going but on online. The, yeah, and, the consultation uh, period, but the politicians are not even involved, or political parties are not even involved in the consultation. I, I guess it's the Tunisian people that have decided at the end of the day, because the majority of them, uh, the online platform is open for them. But like we discussed at uh, the other time when yeah. we had our guests from Tunisia, What's the uh, internet penetration rate in um, Indonesia? And like you rightly said, if politicians, if citizen society groups are not involved, then what, then what exactly have? is the exercise? And yesterday about? we saw a large number of people come out to protest against, uh, of course, the slow delay in uh, uh, preventing justice, talking about judicial system mm -hmm. in Tunisia. So we see people who are calling that uh, justice needs to be served for the killing and assassination of okay. uh, a particular le a leftist, that's uh, uh, Shoguel. And we do expect that the president and, of course, all the international bodies will listen to the pleas of Tunisians and, of course, uh, make sure that democracy once again is instituted back in Tunis. Okay, it's the conversation. This is where we drop the anchor on today's program. Join us on Wednesday for another interesting look at politics on the continent and Benga Boroa. I am Rita Omwadia.